Israel. What a nation. Two times in her past she was nearly totally destroyed and once again Israel is a nation in her own land. And practically the entire world is looking to the Middle East as a sign of the end of this world's history. In the Old Testament, the temple was the center, the focal point of Israel's worship. The temple was the place where the sacrifices were offered. The temple was the place where God was to meet with his people. But in the year 70 A.D., the Roman general Titus destroyed the temple. Prophets predicted it would happen, and prophets predicted the temple would be rebuilt. One of my very favorite places is in the Old Testament book of Amos, the ninth chapter, verse 11. In that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I'll repair its broken places. I'll restore its ruins. I'll build as it, as it used to be so that it may possess the remnant of Edom. He foresaw the time when Jerusalem and the temple would be restored. And today along with the popular novel series left behind with 70 million people are following along the popular Christian understanding looking to the Middle East waiting for the temple to be rebuilt as a sign of the very end of this world's history. This is a novel. Now God uses novels. He used these books to create in people an awareness of the seriousness of the times we're living in. But this is a novel. This is the truth, and we find our truth in this book. Amen? Amen. So what does the Bible teach us about the Israel of God? When I first started studying this topic, I discovered three, I call them, curious Bible texts. The first one is in Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to show you two of them quickly here, and then later on we'll get to the third one. Revelation chapter 2, in verse, in verse 9, Jesus said, I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews, but they are not. They're a synagogue of Satan. Now, synagogue is another word for a temple. So who is it? that would say, I am a Jew, when they're not a Jew. But in fact, they are a synagogue of Satan. Now that, that made me curious. And then a second one, Romans. Turn to Romans, the second chapter, verse 28. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Now that's curious to me. He says a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly. This means that a man can be born into a Jewish family and be physically and outwardly Jewish, but for some reason God says he's not a Jew. Now that made me curious. And I began to wonder, is it possible that these curious texts are telling us that maybe we're overlooking the real significance of Israel in prophecy. And so I began to study from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, and I found a beautiful thread of truth that focuses and centers on Jesus Christ, just like the book of Revelation says it should. 
I want you to just fasten your seat belts, hold on for dear life, because we're going to cover a lot of Bible. Not time for a lot of stories this time. We're going to cover a lot of Bible, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. So let's pick up where we left off. Adam and Eve had just plunged the world into the depths of sin and despair when they ate the fruit from the tree that God said they shouldn't eat from. And then we learned that God was there running after them, calling after them. Where are you when they were fleeing from him? They were running from God and he went running after them. That's the kind of God that we serve. We run from him, he comes after us. And then he gave them a promise, remember? In chapter 3, verse 15, I'll put enmity between you, that's the serpent, the devil, and the woman, and between your offspring, those who choose to follow the devil, and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The strike on the heel was when Jesus, the offspring of the woman, died on the cross. But it wasn't the final blow because he was raised up again three days later, ascended to heaven, and one day soon is going to come back and crush the head of the serpent. This is the first prophecy in the Bible. All the rest of Scripture is unpacking that one promise that the seed of the woman, Jesus, is going to crush the head of the serpent. But we need to understand that when God told Adam and Eve there was only one woman living on this planet, and that was Eve. Naturally, they thought that she was the woman. And she would have a son, and her son would be the one to crush the head of the serpent. In fact, she did have a son, and they named him Cain. And when Cain was born, she said in chapter 4 of Genesis, in verse 1, she said, I have brought forth a man, the Lord. Adam and Eve thought that Cain was the descendant who would crush the head of the serpent. In fact, when they named him Cain, it means in Hebrew, acquired. They thought they had acquired the fulfillment of that promise. You see, they took and understood God's words literally. But God meant something much deeper and much broader than the literal word. And I've discovered that millions of people make the same mistake that Adam and Eve made when they try to interpret God's Word literally and God meant something far different. They named him Cain because they thought they had acquired the Lord who would be the fulfillment of the promise and crush the head of the serpent. But the only head that Cain crushed was the head of his own brother Abel. So they misinterpreted the prophecy. Cain failed. And it wasn't until thousands of years later that we see that seed mentioned again in Genesis, the 12th chapter. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, whose name was later changed to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. So God wanted Abram to leave his country to go to a new place, and I'll show you where to go, God said. In verse 2, I will make you into a great nation. Underline that. God's promise to Abraham, I'll make you into a great nation. And look, at the end of verse 3, and all of the people on earth will be blessed through you. So God is promising Abraham, if you go to the land that I'm going to show you, I'll build you into a great nation and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Now the promise of the blessing was not just for the nation that comes from Abraham. The promise of the blessing was that all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. Underline those words, all of the people of the earth will be blessed through you. We're going to see them again. We're going to come back to them. They're so important. Abraham traveled through the land in verse 6 and he saw Canaanites living in the land. After all, he was in the land of Canaan. That's where God brought him. Canaanites lived there. And the Lord appeared to Abram and he said, To your offspring. 
I will give this land. You see, God is the one who owns it all in the first place. And he can do with it as he pleases. To your offspring, I will give this land. Now, that's a promise. I see two promises here. One, the first one, is Abraham, through you and your offspring, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. And secondly, to your offspring, I will give this land. Now, the problem is, Abraham had no offspring. He was almost 100 years old. And so was his wife, Sarah. So how, in fact, she couldn't even have babies. Sarah was barren. So how is God going to fulfill his promise to Abraham? Well, Abraham and Sarah started thinking about it a little bit, and Sarah came up with a plan. She says, Abraham, I have this beautiful young maid. Her name is Hagar. Why don't you sleep with her, and then she can have your son, and God can fulfill the promise that he made to you? And Abraham said, Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> so he did. Abraham slept with her. And she had a son. And they named him Ishmael. Ishmael. Now God could fulfill his promise that he made to Abraham through your seed, Ishmael, all the, the nations of the earth will be blessed. But God said no. In chapter 17, verse 19, your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you'll call him Isaac, and I'll establish my covenant with him. Now that's interesting. Didn't God say, Abraham, your son through your son, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He did. Wasn't Ishmael Abraham's son? He was. He was just as much Abraham's son as Isaac was. In fact, he was Abraham's firstborn son. And the firstborn is the one that usually gets the blessing. So why did God say no to Ishmael and yes to Isaac? Can't you see that here already in the Old Testament we can discover that God's promise was something more than simply to a flesh and blood physical descendant of Abraham? If all that mattered was flesh and blood, then it should have been Ishmael. But God said no to Ishmael, yes to Isaac. There's something deeper, something broader happening here. Let's take a look. By the way, Isaac went on to become the father of the Jewish race. Ishmael, the father of the Arab race. And Isaac and Ishmael are still fighting today. That's what happens when instead of trusting God who made us, who knows us, who knows more about us than we know about ourselves, that's what happens when instead of trusting God we trust in our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own works instead of believing God by faith. So every time you see a tank rolling through the streets of Jerusalem, every time you hear about a missile flying over Palestine in the Middle East, it's a reminder that we are saved by faith in trusting God and not by works. Abraham tried it by works and works didn't work. Only faith works. Amen? Isaac married Rebekah, and Isaac and Rebekah had two sons. 
Esau and Jacob, twins born from the same womb at the same time. In fact, Esau was born a few minutes ahead of Jacob. He was the older. He was the firstborn. He was the descendant that should have received the blessing, but God said no to Esau and yes to Jacob. Why? Can't you see that the promise God made to Abraham through your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed has to be something more than simply being a physical descendant of Abraham. If that's all it was, then it should have been Ishmael. If that's all it was, then it should have been Esau. But God said no. There's something more happening here. Jacob means a deceiver. He was not a nice boy. He deceived his brother and his father into getting that birthright. But Jacob repented of his sins. He asked God to forgive him. And God forgives us when we repent. Amen? That's good news. <laughs> he forgave Jacob. In fact, Jacob wrestled all night with God and finally he got the victory and because of that, God gave Jacob a new name. He called him Israel. A name coined by God. A name that never existed before, either in the Bible or outside of the Bible. A name that had spiritual significance from its very beginning, Israel began with one man. And it was symbolic of his spiritual experience with God. In fact, I'll tell you a secret about Israel. The Hebrew Yishrael, it's two words. Yishra is to rule or to be ruled. And L is God. Yisrael, Israel, means God rules. And every time you watch the news and you hear a news commentator say, Israel, he's really saying God rules. Yeah. Don't tell them that. They'll quit saying it. <laughs> Israel was to be a people ruled by God. Israel was to be a people who by faith trusted God, believed Him to live the way He made us to live. They would be ruled by God. Israel. Israel began to grow to a big family and into a nation. Then there was a famine in the land and Israel found herself in Egypt for over 400 years, slaves to the Pharaoh. God raised up a man, Moses, and delivered Israel from Egyptian slavery through the waters of the Red Sea where he miraculously dried them up across the Sinai Peninsula to Mount Sinai where there he gave them his law and a blueprint for the temple. And after 40 years of the nation of Israel wandering in the wilderness and the desert, we find them about to enter that promised land and take possession. Moses is ready to preach his final sermon to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And here it is, his last words before they entered the land. Verse 1, If you carefully obey the Lord your God and follow all of his commands I give you today, and if you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth and all of these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. Five times in these first 16 verses, God says, I will pour out all of these blessings upon you if you obey. 
After all, Israel was to be a nation led by God, ruled by God. If you obey, I'll bless you. Look, verse 4. The fruit of your womb will be blessed. The crops of your land, your livestock, your lambs, your herd, your cows, your animals. The Lord will grant that your enemies who rise against you be defeated. You'll be a wealthy nation, a powerful nation. Even your babies won't get sick and die. Your corn will grow taller. Well, why did God want to bless Israel like that? You see, God wanted to bless Israel so that all of the other nations could see. Well, her corn grows taller. Her cows get fatter. Her babies don't get sick and die. We want to know the secret. So they would go to Israel to find her secret. And when they go to Israel to find her secret, they discover Israel's God. And all of the nations of the earth would be blessed through Israel. If she obeyed the Lord her God. You see, there was a condition to that promise. Well, what would happen if Israel didn't obey God? Verse 15 tells us, However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all of His commands and decrees that I give you today, then all of these curses will come upon you. So if you obey the blessing, I'll gather you into the land. I'll bless you if you disobey the curse. And some of the curses that he mentions, some of the curses he mentions in verse 21, diseases, cancer, heart attacks, AIDS, bird flu, swine flu, all the result of turning away from God. The environment even, verse 23, the sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath you iron. The rain of your country will turn into dust and powder. Even the environment is affected when men and women rebel against God. Can't you see? Look around you. There are terrible problems on this planet. This world is in trouble. But the trouble is not because of the planet. The trouble is because of sin and rebellion against God. Remember, God created the universe to function by certain laws. And when one of those laws is broken, the whole thing would crash. And He created man and woman to live within the circle of the laws that He put within them. But when we step outside of that circle, get, things go wrong. And even the environment suffers. Marriages will fall apart. Diseases that can't be cured. You'll build a house, but you won't live in it. Plant a vineyard, and you'll not even begin to enjoy its fruit. And your donkey will be taken from you forcefully and not returned. That sounds like income tax to me. <laughs> Bad things happen when you turn away from God. A people that don't know you will eat what's in your land and your labor produces. There'll be cruel oppression, abuse, despair, because they turn away from God. So if you bless me, if you obey me, I'll bless you. I'll gather you into the land, build you into a powerful nation. But if you disobey, then I'll scatter you. Verse 64, the Lord will scatter you among all the nations from one end of the earth to the other, and these curses will come upon you. Now, the curse is just as much a promise as the blessing, isn't it? I mean, God means what He says. If you obey, I'll bless. If you disobey the curse, that's a promise. Sometimes we tell our kids, if you don't behave, it's going to be or else. And they don't behave, and there's never an or else. But not with God. God speaks the truth. If you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. Not because he wants to curse us, but because when we step outside of that boundary, bad things happen, and we break Well, we know the sad story. Israel disobeyed God. Wouldn't listen to the prophets. Wouldn't even listen to Jesus Christ. They crucified Him. In A.D. 70, the temple was destroyed. And Israel was scattered among all the nations of the earth just the way the prophets said it would happen. But that isn't God's final word. 
Moses had a little more to say in chapter 30, verse 1, when all these blessings and curses that I set before you come upon you, and if you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you or scatters you among the nations, watch this. When you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all of your heart and all of your soul according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and He will gather you back into the land from where you have been scattered. So that wasn't the final word. 70 A.D., Israel was scattered among all the nations of the earth. But God says, if you turn to me with all of your heart and all of your soul, if you obey my commands, then I will gather you back into the land and I'll bless you. There's hope. Israel disobeyed God. Israel was scattered among the nations of the earth. So what does Israel have to do first before God can gather her back into the land? Turn to the Lord with all of our heart. Obey Him. Well, Israel is back in the land today. But the nation of Israel hasn't turned to God. She doesn't obey God. Even how Lindsay admits 90% of the people in Israel are atheists. No less except Jesus Christ. Now we're beginning to see more and more Jewish people in Israel turning to Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. But that's not the nation. So how could God gather them back into the land when he said, if you obey me, then I'll gather you back into the land? Did God's word fail? No. Of course not. And that's why we need to finish in the New Testament. And there's that third curious text that I promised you, Romans chapter 9. In Romans, the ninth chapter. Verse 6, it is not as though God's Word had failed. God's Word didn't fail. Why not? Are you ready for this? Because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Some people have descended from Israel. They're not Israel. Watch this. Verse 7, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. Whoa! Abraham has children and God says they're not his children. What's going on here? You see, this is more than just flesh and blood children. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. Watch. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Not Esau, but Isaac. Notice that your offspring will be reckoned. You see, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's no such thing as a physical Jew. There is. But the offspring, the promise, is not reckoned as a descendant. It's only through Isaac that his descendants are reckoned. In other words, if you haven't got it yet, he's going to make it clearer. Watch this. In verse 8, it is not the natural children who are God's children. Not the natural children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. That means Abraham has children that are not his children. Why not? Because it's only the children of the promise that are regarded by God as Abraham's offspring. What seems to be right to us is not always what is right with God, remember? And just because he had a physical son, Ishmael, just because Isaac had a physical son, Esau, it doesn't mean that they were descendants because only children of the promise are regarded by God as Abraham's offspring. So who are the children of the promise? That's the big question. And this takes us to one of my very favorite little books, the little book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Who are the children of the promise? Now, if you have to take a little nap, don't do it now. 
Wake up anybody next to you that might be sleeping a little bit because you don't want to miss this. This is the best part. Who are the children of the promise? Remember, it, just because Abraham had descendants, that doesn't mean they were his children. It's only the children of the promise that are reckoned as his children. Who are the children of the promise? Here's the answer. Verse 7. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. Who are the children of Abraham? Those who believe. You see, Jacob believed. Isaac believed. Esau didn't believe. Ishmael didn't believe. So the deciding factor isn't their physical descendancy. The deciding factor is do they believe or not? That's not all, though. It gets better. Here we go, verse 8. The Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. Let me explain that a little bit. Justify is a technical Bible word for save. When we're justified, we're saved by faith, the Bible says. Not by works. We're saved by faith. So the Bible says... The Scripture foresaw God would justify Gentiles by faith. What's a Gentile? A Gentile is simply one who is not born a physical Jew. I'm half Italian, half Puerto Rican. I'm a Gentile. And so God is telling us the Scripture foresaw that He would justify Italians. Puerto Ricans, Germans, English, African, no matter what, he would justify us by faith. Now, where did the Scripture say that? And he announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news that you're not saved by being good. You're not saved by obeying the commands. No, we are saved because we trust God, because we have faith in God. We're saved by grace, unmerited. We don't deserve it through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. That's the gospel. Jesus died on the cross in your place. And if you accept Him as your Savior, God gives you the free gift of eternal life. That's the gospel. But where did God preach the gospel in advance to Abraham? Here's the surprise. When he said, all nations will be blessed through you. He said, well, I don't understand that. What does it mean? When God said, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you, he was really preaching the gospel. Let me help you understand that. I'll paraphrase it a little bit. God said, Abraham, one of these days I'm going to send through your line my son. And Abraham, my son who comes through your line is going to die on the cross. But that won't be the end, Abraham. Abraham. Three days later, he's going to be raised up again. And Abraham, anyone who believes in my son will be saved. Through my son, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. How can you just say a weak amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, that's so much better. This is good stuff. And it gets even better. Watch this. Verse 16. Now, this blows some people away. They don't even like it. But I like it because it's in here. Verse 16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now, watch. Abraham and his seed. Paul says the Scripture does not say and to his seeds with an S on the end, meaning many people. No, no, he says, but and to your seed, singular, meaning one person who is Christ. 
So when Abraham, when God said, Abraham, through your seed, uh, singular, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, he wasn't talking about many people. He was talking about one person, and that one person is Jesus Christ. It was singular, not plural. Now that's exciting, isn't it? Well, if that's the case, then how are all the nations of the earth going to be blessed? What about the promise? Is Jesus the only one that's going to be blessed and saved? Well, it gets even better. Galatians isn't over yet. In chapter 3, verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Because, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heir to all the promises. Amen. Amen. Do you belong to Jesus? If you do, then you are a descendant of Abraham. Amen. And it doesn't matter what kind of blood flowing through your veins. It doesn't matter how your mom and dad spell their name. It doesn't matter what country you live in. It doesn't matter what your blood is. The only blood that matters is the blood that was shed for you on Calvary 2,000 years ago. If you believe in Jesus, you are a descendant of Abraham. Wow! All the promises I can claim. All the promises you can claim. The promises were never based on flesh and blood descendancy, not even from the beginning. They were always based on faith in God and trust in God through Jesus Christ. It's always been that way. So you see, in the New Testament, the Israel of God consists of those who believe in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul closes his letter to the church at Galatia saying in Galatians chapter 6, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. And the new creation is you and me in born again in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter if you're circumcised. It doesn't matter if you're not circumcised. What matters is, are you in Jesus Christ, a new creation? And then verse 16, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. See, the Israel of God consists of all who believe in Jesus Christ. The church has picked up the mantle of Israel and is carrying it on all the way through to the end. You are a part of the Israel of God. It doesn't mean there's no such thing as a Jew. No. But it does mean that a Jew is no more accepted by God because he's a Jew than I'm accepted by God because I'm Italian or Puerto Rican. The only way we're accepted by God, Jew or Gentile, is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But what about the Jews now? Are they finished? No. In Romans, the 11th chapter, Paul tells a story. He tells the story of an olive tree. And he said, some of the branches of that olive tree were cut off because they didn't believe in Jesus. Some of them stayed in. The disciples were Jews. They stayed in the tree. And that was Israel. And Jesus is the tree. And then he said, the wild olive branch, that's me and you, Gentiles, wild olive branches are grafted back in, grafted into the same tree that the Jews who didn't believe were cut off of. And then those Jews, he said, finally when they believe in Jesus, they're going to go grafted back into the same tree with the Gentiles. The tree is the church of Jesus Christ. When a Jew accepts Jesus Christ, he becomes a true Jew. And so when he says, I'm a Jew, he's not telling a lie. He is not the synagogue of Satan. He is a Jew because he is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I believe Romans 11 shows a time coming when many Jews will turn to Jesus Christ because that's the only way we can all ever be saved. Is this true? You're saying, Pastor, that's not what I keep hearing out there. 
Well, I don't care what's happening out there. All I care about is what's in here. Is it true? Every word has come from in here, but let's just check it out. Let's ask Peter. Peter, is Jack Cologne telling us the truth? Well, turn in your Bibles to Peter. And I'll find him. He was here this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You, he's writing to the church now, watch this, you church, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That's exactly what God said to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Now he's calling this church by the same titles. He said, God called you so that you can declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his light. Once you were not a people. You were Gentiles. You were not a people. But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He's calling the church a holy nation. Royal priesthood. The people belonging to God. In fact, he goes on to say, now we're getting to another good part, don't sleep. As you come to him, the living stone, Jesus is the living stone. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. So Jesus is the living stone, but we too are living stones, the Bible says. And we too are being built into a spiritual house. Now when we go to Ephesians, the ch second chapter, in verse 19, he says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. That's us Gentiles that he's talking to. The church in Ephesus consisting of Gentiles. He says, you Gentiles, you are no longer foreigners. You're no longer aliens. But you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Watch this built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. You are the stones of the temple. I promised you I'd bring you a piece of the temple. Turn to the person to your left and to your right and say, Welcome to the temple of God because you are the stones of the temple. I told you that I was on the committee to rebuild the temple. You can be on that committee. When you tell someone about Jesus Christ, you are on the committee to rebuild the temple. Sometimes people get mad at me. And they say, Pastor, I thought I was going to see a brick here tonight. One lady sitting in the front row in Alaska had her camera there ready to take a picture of the stone. I said, well, I'll smile for you. <laughs> she got mad. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at whoever's telling you that it's going to be a real stone. Because you are the stone. Jesus is the cornerstone. You are the temple. But what about the land? God said he promised the land to Abraham's seed, didn't he? In Acts chapter 7, we find a surprise there. Acts the 7th chapter, Stephen, in his last sermon before he died, told the story about how Abraham, verse 4, left the land of the Chaldeans 
and God sent him to this land that you're now living in and he gave him no inheritance here not even a foot of ground but God had promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land now did God's word fail God said you would possess the land and now Stephen says that he didn't even get one square foot of ground did God's word fail no because Abraham understood exactly what God meant in Hebrews you can read that in Hebrews chapter 11 look in Hebrews 11 the faith chapter it says in verse 9 by faith he Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country he lived in tents like Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise for he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God Abraham knew that God was not talking about that land in Palestine Abraham was looking to the new Jerusalem to the new heaven to the new earth in fact Paul himself even wrote that God promised Abraham that he would be heir even of the world you see God promises the land but he always gives us more than what he says he's gonna do what a God amen Abraham saw it. In, Re in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, Jesus writes to the church, Him who overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. You see, the church, He who overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. You'll never leave it. I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that is coming down out of heaven from God. I'll also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The new Jerusalem is the home for the church of Jesus Christ. And you are citizens of that city. He even says as much in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, he says, you have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. We are now citizens of that new Jerusalem, even though we're here in this old world. But one day soon, it's going to come down to this earth, and we're going to be in it, and that will be our home forever. Amen. Oh, what a promise. I know some of you are struggling. Some of you are saying, Pastor, that's not what it says in the Left Behind book. No, it's not what it says in the novel. But it is what it says in God's Word. Amen. And you know, even in Jesus' day, they struggled with this. They had a hard time accepting what you're hearing right now. The Jews were stunned in John chapter 2, verse 19, when Jesus said, pointing to the building, to the temple, he said, tear down this temple and I will raise it up in three days. They thought he was talking about the building. And he knew they thought they would think he was talking about the building. But in fact, he was talking about himself. And they were stunned. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't make a shift from the bricks and the mortar to the living stone of Jesus Christ. Amen. We can't afford to make the same mistake that they made back then. In fact, they missed it so badly that in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus was on the cross, they said, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it up in three days? Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. They missed it so badly that they didn't understand that the only way for Jesus to truly rebuild the true temple was to die on the cross. He could not come down from the cross and rebuild the temple. They missed it. Let's not make the same mistake. Now we can understand why Jesus said when he went into the temple, Matthew 12, 
verse 6, I tell you, one greater than this temple is here. But they missed it. They kept looking at the building instead of looking at the man, Jesus Christ. And no wonder when Jesus went into the temple for the last time and left, he said, your house is left unto you desolate because the presence of the living God was leaving that temple for the first time, for the last time, to build his new temple by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. No wonder, he said, your house is left desolate. But what about the Antichrist? What about the Antichrist? Doesn't he rebuild that temple in Jerusalem and then go over there and destroy it? 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians makes it crystal clear. Chapter 2, verse 4. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God. This is Antichrist. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Every place in the New Testament where Paul uses the word God's temple, he's talking about the church of Jesus Christ. Antichrist sets himself up in the church and he does his dirty work in the church when the whole world practically is looking to Israel waiting for the mosque to be torn down so they can build the temple for Antichrist to come Antichrist is doing his dirty work in the church what's he doing there do you want to know? Because you're going to see some things that are going to make your eyes turn as big as saucers. He will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Revelation chapter 21. I want to close in Revelation chapter 21. Verse 9, one of the seven angels said, Come, and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and he showed me the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at each of the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Only the Israel of God can enter that city. Won't you walk through those gates with me? O oh, Israel of God. Several years ago, my wife and I went to a religious convention in Toronto, Canada. And one day, a Jewish man, dressed in his black Jewish robes, Jewish hat, and his Hebrew books and Bibles, was walking down the hallway when he looked ahead and he saw an Arab man dressed in his traditional Arab headdress with his Arab books in his arms walking right towards him. And the Jew was afraid And the Arab was afraid. 
as they approached each other closer and closer. And then they both stopped outside the same door, about to go in. And the Jewish man looked at the Arab man, and he said, Are you a Christian? And the Arab said, I'm a Christian. Are you? And the Jewish man said, Yes, I'm a Christian. And the Arab and the Jew embraced. You see, the solution to the problems is not going to be done in Washington, D.C., or by any diplomat. The problem can only be solved by lifting up the cross of Jesus Christ, Amen. the true Israel of God. O oh Lord God, we thank you and we praise you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for having a plan. Sometimes men fail. They did all the way through the Bible times. But your plan never fails. And Lord, we want to be a part of your plan. We want to walk with you. And we want to walk through the gates of that city rejoicing as the bride of the Lamb. And we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.